Thank you, Denise. Um, and uh, hello, everybody. <clears throat> very happy we're having this discussion, and very happy that we're having it on Go to Meeting. I, I hope that this will be the first of a permanent change in the uh, work of the National Board, at least in terms of how we communicate and organize these uh, meetings. This presentation is based on an article that I wrote uh, for the party website several weeks ago and a presentation that I gave to the Chicago party uh, last week with some uh, minor uh, modifications. I think I'd like to start this way. Uh, when I was a younger man and um, had hair, um, after I graduated from college, I, I moved to Washington. And while living in Washington, um, I worked for a neighborhood association uh, in the Sixth Ward. And one day, I think it was a spring day, the air conditioner broke and uh, a technician came to uh, fix it. And he was a kind of a burly, uh, I would say 30-ish uh, white guy um, and very friendly and we got to talking um, and he shared with me um, some of his political views and, and uh, he described the situation in the country uh, in the following way. He said that the country was occupied by something he called ZOG, Z -O -G, which, stood, which is an, was an acronym for the Zionist Occupational Government, uh, that, that, that the country was dominated by globalists uh, and that they were seeking to uh, impose uh, one world government and uh, and that they were you know, using all these nefarious devices uh, and programs and black helicopters and so on and so forth um, and I got that guy out of my office as quickly as I possibly could. I tell the story because I was reminded of it this morning when I read an article uh, in The Hill about Steve Bannon, who is the chairman of Trump's campaign, and Bannon's uh, war against the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. And in the article, and mind you, this is in The Hill, which is a website that's devoted to the politics of Capitol Hill, and they described his politics and uh, and, and they described it uh, as viewing Ryan as a globalist. Bannon views uh, Ryan as a globalist, as a person who is attempting to impose one world government. You see, the same politics that was espoused by this fellow um, 30 years ago in my office is the politics, is this paranoid, right-wing, fascistic kind of politics that is now um, heading the Trump campaign. That is, that is what we are uh, dealing with, this uh, joker who is the head of uh, Breitbart News and who Donald Trump made uh, the chairman of his campaign. So think about that as I make my presentation. In my article, Neoliberalism and the Fascist Danger, I was trying to respond to a critique of the Communist Party's electoral policy from the left. And the critique went like this. They said, we agree with you. Trump is a real danger, and that he carries with him more than a whiff of fascism. But they said, what you guys aren't dealing with are the policies that are giving rise to him, neoliberal policies. By that, they meant the policy of austerity, budget cuts, privatization, you know, uh, charter schools. They want to privatize the post office, deregulation, 
letting the banks do whatever the hell they want and then bailing them out. Free trade, NAFTA, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, the exporting of jobs and capital abroad. And these policies, they say, are being practiced across the board by Republicans and Democrats, and that they are producing and reproducing these right-wing and even fascist currents. How? Because working people are mad as hell at what's taking place, and this anger, particularly among white workers, is throwing them into the arms of Trump. And by not recognizing, they're saying to us, you Communist Party people are, in fact, facilitating its growth. Now, that's one hell of a charge. And it's being made by young people, by millennials, by people in the ages of 18 to 30. And they're making uh, these uh, criticisms uh, on, on Facebook. And by the way, these are the overwhelming majority of people who read our articles uh, on our websites at the PW and on the party websites. And these are the majority of the people who uh, visit our pages on Facebook. And by the way, there is a simple majority of these people who, according to a Gallup poll, are now opposed to capitalism. So it is a very important constituency. And I felt that, you know, we um, haven't been targeting them enough specifically, and we haven't been responding enough specifically to uh, their concerns. In fact, my view is that to a certain degree we, try, we, we, we tend to dismiss them and kind of write them off as ultra-left kind of people and so on and so forth and, and don't deal with their arguments, I don't think, systematically uh, enough. And so I wanted to uh, respond to that, um, that charge, that we are in fact uh, facilitating its growth by not recognizing the difficulties uh, with neoliberalism. And you know what? I think they have a point. These policies, um, you know, cuts, privatization, deregulation have, in fact, wreaked havoc on the lives of the working class and poor. But that said, there was something about the argumentation um, and the ideas behind the argumentation that just didn't seem right to me. It was unsettling and it didn't make much sense. And so I thought that I would respond to it. In fact, there were there were three principal things that 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 um, occurred to me. First, is it really the case that white working class people are the main base of the Trump movement? I mean, I know that Trump has positioned himself. In fact, we heard an echo of that in the conversation just a few minutes ago. Trump has called himself the blue collar billionaire and run that kind of campaign, but a white worker is really his mass base. Second, the argument is made that the policy itself, neoliberalism, is the thing that is responsible for the anger. But here again, is the problem really policy? I mean, there have been a lot of policies that have been employed by the ruling class over the years, right? I mean, there was laissez-faire capitalism, there was Keynesianism, now neoliberalism. Is it the policy that's the problem, or is something deeper going on, you know? Um, and and if, it's, if it's the policy, then, you know, we also know that neoliberalism has come relatively late on the scene, but the problem with fascism has been with us, you know, for a certain time. So both as a problem of history and, and as a problem of theory, it just didn't make too much sense to me. I'll come back to that in just a moment. And third, I was bothered that most of the fire directed by our young critics um, is directed at Democrats. You know, most of the fire that uh, 
uh, an anger at this new liberal policy is directed at Democrats. And that confuses me because at least in my experience, budget cuts, charter schools, union busting, these are the heart and soul of GOP policy, right? And so why was it that the Democrats are asked to, you know, shoulder most of the blame? Not that I'm a big fan of the Democratic Party, you know, I'm not. That's why I'm in the Communist Party. But it seemed to me that, 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 that this targeting, particularly in light of this election campaign, was a big, big problem. And as I thought about it, um, three more issues became apparent to me. First, um, I said it was a problem of history. Yes, neoliberalism arose historically as a right-wing critique of the New Deal. They argue that government spending to stimulate the economy, which is called Keynesianism, led to deficits and stagnation, and that when these problems emerged in the 70s and 80s, the austerity pushers stepped forward, first with Reagan and then with David Stockman and their budget cuts. They busted PACO uh, and imposed uh, the first, or tried to impose the first edition of the charter school movement. I remember I was, uh, once again, I was living back in D.C. during those years. And we, uh, I remember a big meeting organized by the Central Labor Council of Washington uh, with the African-American ministers. And, and uh, they, they, they were enraged at this attempt to cut public education. I spoke at that meeting. They said, we're not going back. Of course, a few years later, the situation was re reversed after that faith-based initiative, and many of them took some of that money and got bought off, and, and that charter school situation uh, got imposed uh, on the D.C. public school system. But that at least was the beginning of it. Second, this neoliberal policy got a, uh, another head of wind and a broader base when it began to be imposed by the likes of Bill Clinton and the Democratic Leadership Council. Clinton, if you remember, was the main promoter of what he called the third way, or triangulation, which in essence was the sugar coating of right-wing policies, but with Bill's softer, gentler, I feel your pain tone. With Clinton, these policies moved from the right to the political center and brought with it a section of the liberal left. And it's the left that we are primarily concerned with, which brings me to my third point. Clinton was bosom buddies with Tony Blair, who, as you know, became the prime minister of the United Kingdom as head of the Labor Party and headed up a group in the Labor Party called New Labor, which is the British equivalent of the Democratic Leadership Council. But Blair, unlike Clinton, purported to be a man of the left and headed a working class based party, albeit with a social democratic orientation. But Blair also had a relationship with the communist left, in particular with the editor, uh, editors of Marxism Today, which was the theoretical journal of the Communist Party of Great Britain. And Marxism Today served as a platform for these sugar-coated right-wing policies. In fact, Blair wrote for Marxism today, as did Gordon Brown. In fact, those in Blair's inner circle credited it, it being Marxism today with being the main thing that helped legitimize these ideas, helping the new labor faction to become dominant in the British Labor Party and move it to the right. And if you don't believe me, you can check out a program on BBC entitled Where Have All the Comrades Gone? Uh, that quotes these uh, 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 fellows and women uh, making these points. Where have all the comrades uh, gone on BBC? You can download the pod podcast. So there you have it. A policy, an ideology that began on the right, accepted by the center and dominant even on the left. And there it has reigned for the last 30 years up uh, until at least the Great Recession and its uh, aftershocks. 
Now, before I leave and, and move on, um, another point um, that I didn't raise in my article, and I think it's a really important one uh, ideologically. And it was first articulated by Margaret Thatcher uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, and Mrs. Thatcher uh, said very simply, after that collapse, there is no alternative. History has ended, the free market has triumphed, and there is no alternative. T-I-N-A, Tina, T for their I for is, you get the point. Um, Tina. And in a sense, this uh, concept of there is no alternative is the foundation of third way ideology. Socialism doesn't work. Its former champions have to manage, therefore, the best way they know how, by attempting to apply its promised aims within the confines of capitalism. Um, this bears on our discussion this evening because even now, with many arguing that with Brexit and with Greece and with Trump and with Sanders, that neoliberalism has reached its limit. Um, people are, are, uh, are asking, therefore, what will replace it? Keynesianism don't work. Socialism has failed. Neoliberalism, people are angry and rebelling all over the place in Europe and the United States, and so and so what, what comes next, um, which we'll deal with in just a moment. Let me now turn to the nature of the danger that we face and, and who it's from. Regarding the nature of the danger, there's been some debate. Some don't see it. Some uh, and view Trump as just another GOP politician, albeit uh, with a few rough edges. Others see the danger more as authoritarianism, that indeed Trump has those rough edges and a program that re would require an overuse of executive power. But after all, they say the left is weak and unorganized and presents no real threat. They look to Germany and other countries that have suffered under fascism and they're like, you know, we don't see no comparison between what's going on uh, here and what we are, what's, what was going on there, and what we are confronting here. I recently received a letter that offered a variation of this view. The author said, Joe, what in the hell are you talking about? There are no brown shirts here. There's no coherent fascist ideology. There's no mass Marxist party to threaten the powers that be. You know, what, what are you talking about? And I replied that, you know, buddy, all of that is true. But in my view, it's almost besides the point. And I suggested that we have to understand the danger uh, along U.S. terms, you know, based on what we're going through at this time, based on what we've experienced in our own particular history, without, you know, of course, ignoring the world experience. And our experience must take into account, first, that Trump, represents a danger of a different type. He comes from a section of the ruling class that is particularly vicious and decadent. It's a group with strong ties to the mob, a section schooled in the fine arts of political gangsterism, a section that cut its teeth on the likes of Joe McCarthy and schooled by Roy Cohn, who Roy Cohn was a political thug of the highest order. And of course, we know that Trump was Roy Cohn's protege. And Cohn, in addition to being uh, an anti-communist hatchet man, you remember he was the one who was personally responsible for ordering Ellen Rosenberg's execution. Cohn was a master of walking the line between legal and extra-legal activity. His political and legal strategy was based on a never-ending blitzkrieg on being constantly on the offensive, of never apologizing, of constantly keeping your opponent off his or her feet. Sound familiar? And with these guys, you know, there's no regard for law. Law is not a social contract. 
It's not a covenant with the governed, uh, but an instrument to be used or discarded according to the needs of any given moment. And that includes the Constitution. Got a problem with it, ignore it, and then pursue anybody who challenges you with a vengeance. Think about how Trump is going after Paul Ryan now and how he went after uh, Alicia Mochado two weeks ago um, and, and, and so on all down the line. And that by itself is extremely dangerous. And if that wasn't enough, now you have, as I indicated at the top of this presentation, Stephen Bannon at the head of Breitbart News, which is an organizing platform for the alt-right heading the Trump campaign. The alt-right, which stands for the alternative right, uh, are basically uh, neo-Nazis and KKK types in suits. And these are people who, who again, view people like Ryan and, uh, and uh, Bona and Clinton and Obama as globalists, as people who are attempting to uh, impose uh, one world government as representatives of the Zog, the Zionist occupational government, and this is a fascist kind of, uh, kind of uh, movement. And they have now, they have now assumed commanding positions in the GOP. And, and, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Hillary Clinton herself pointed out that they have assumed commanding positions in the GOP and, and if elected, uh, would be well placed in a Trump administration. Can you imagine the alt-right as attorney general? Well, they say this joker from New Jersey is going to be the Attorney General, but head of the FBI, Homeland Security, in the National Security Council, CIA, FBI, you, you can imagine what we are dealing with. Uh, uh, and, and, and then, you know, consider the atmosphere, and, and I, I, I made the point in the article, and I, I want to restate it, it was stated in the uh, discussion earlier today, there has been um, the legitimization, the normalization of, of, of certain ideological currents which, which, which make this process uh, much easier. And we would highlight the two, the normalization of, of racism uh, and the normalization of sexism, of, of male supremacy, and that in and of, in and of itself is a very, very dangerous, dangerous thing. Consider what it would take for a moment to enforce some of Trump's proposals. Let's just take one, the, the mass deportation of immigrants. What would that entail? Their, their identification, uh, the surveillance, the enlistment of neighbors and employers to, to uh, snitch on them, the creation of snitch systems, the rounding up, tearing apart of families, midnight raids, internment camps, and so on? Or what would it mean um, for the African-American community? Well, Trump said it, law and order, uh, uh, stop and frisk policing, uh, uh, a national police state uh, legalized in African-American and Latino communities all across the country, um, voter suppression and intimidation, um, you can imagine. And neither the immigrant nor the black community are going to take these issues lying down. You better believe that. And there will be massive resistance and rebellion. And then the issue becomes, what will it take to uh, suppress it? The National Guard, the Army, militias, uh, vigilantes. And keep in mind that, that, that as this occurs, Trump would be beholden to no one. In this connection, sections of the political right and center sensing the danger have directly pointed to the problem, in some cases more so than the left, in my opinion. Robert Kagan, a leading neocon at the Brookings Institute, spoke precisely to this, pointing out that Trump, quote, Trump has transcended the party that produced him, end of quote. He wrote that, quote, 
uh, his growing army of supporters no longer cares about the party. Their allegiance is to him and to him alone. The Washington Post, after initially ignoring the danger in the last several months, have gone into overdrive pointing it out. Last week, they featured a series of editorials on the issue of executive power and what its possible use by Trump might entail. On the center left, even earlier, the New York Times, sensing racism and anti-Semitism, began a crusade, began to crusade editorially against Trump. Um, pointing out uh, his danger. And of course, last week they revealed uh, he didn't, uh, that 970 million tax write off and the fact that he hasn't paid taxes in the last 20 years. Even USA Today, uh, the Cincinnati uh, newspaper, the Cleveland Post Dispatch, uh, the Atlantic, um, several traditionally conservative papers have come out. Uh, uh, indicating that from their point of view, Donald Trump is unfit for the presidency. Um, I read just the other day uh, an editorial by um, none other than George Will, uh, and I never thought I would read an editorial by him that I would agree with in which he described the Republican Party convention as a Nuremberg-like event with the audience shouting, jail her, jail her, jail her. You know, even he recognizes the kind of danger that we are presented with, uh, with uh, Mr. Trump. Actually, an amazing, I think an extremely important loose coalition from sections of the right to the center to sections of the Marxist left have emerged to combat the danger and that I think is very encouraging. And it appears, as we said in our prior discussion, that the situation has changed as we uh, spoke about. But the issue, again, given the election and the possibility of a landslide, is what will be the program, uh, what will be the issues that will drive the nature of the, of the uh, fight back going forward. And here again, uh, this raises the issue of what is the nature of the period that we're living in because uh, many have concluded that these neoliberal policies have reached their apex. Um, I spoke a few moments ago about the characteristics of the period that we're somehow living between and betwixt that neoliberalism has reached its limits on the one side, and no one knows what it will come, what will come next. Many years ago, the great Italian communist Antonio Gramsci spoke of such a period. He said, "The old world is dying, and the new world struggles to be born. This is the time of monsters." I think the answer to the question of what Trump represents has to be understood uh, with that view in mind. That brings me to the final issue that I'd like to deal with uh, this afternoon, and, and that is uh, who is being represented by who in this Trump movement. I think it's an important question. As suggested at the beginning, some argue that the base of Trump support comes from uh, angry lower class whites. Uh, that was the view of uh, Chris Hedges, for example, and that's been the prevailing view in much of the mass media until very recently. However, a couple of studies over the past month or so, first by Nate Silver and 538.com, and then by the Gallup organization have questioned this assertion. 538 studies showed that Trump support and the primaries had a median income of $72,000, um, high above the median household income of the country, which is $52,000, and higher than that of Hillary and Bernie supporters, who came in at a figure of $61,000. Silver argued, by the way, that 44% of Trump supporters in the primaries had college degrees 
which is important given the um, overemphasis, in my view, in the mass media that most of Trump's supporters are people, uh, particularly men, with high school diplomas. Well, that may be true, but it's a simple majority because 44% of them got college degrees. They never say that. Gallup's study is more detailed. Speaking in broad strokes, it suggests that Trump supporters were more likely to be self-employed, remember that, more likely to be self-employed among workers that they were more likely to be employed in production, construction, installation, maintenance, repair, uh, or transportation. Gallup indicated that they tended to live in small towns and segregated communities and identify themselves politically as extremely conservatives. Speaking in broad strokes, this suggests that while it's undeniable that Trump has garnered significant support among sections of white workers, Working America in a study last spring indicated that in the battleground state it's around one in three, that they tend to be those who live in small segregated towns, are older skilled workers with higher incomes. Um, so that I think is, is extremely uh, important. Trump's main base of support then seems to come from a Republican middle strata, broadly defined, who are very conservative and live in these small towns. Those who live in larger cities and in integrated neighborhoods tend to not to support the Republican nominee. I argued in my article that one has to make a distinction between the elements where Trump's ideas have found resonance and the class forces behind it. In my view, the former are a mixture of middle class professional elements, independent contractors and some workers, but the latter, the class forces behind it, are, as in the past, the most reactionary sections of the ruling class. The point here is that fascism's main source are not angry white workers or even middle class elements, but in the top ranks of the 1%. And it is their attempt to manage the crisis that they're confronted with, confronted with. And I think that we have to recognize that for them, it's very much a crisis, a crisis of legitimacy, a crisis of identity, of a perceived loss of a way of life, of stagnant wages, of declining living standards, of a declining rate of profit. In my view, there need not be a revolutionary situation to prompt a descent into the abyss. Sometimes it occurs as a preventative measure to ensure that that does not happen. I've tried over the last uh, half hour or so to present some of the ideas offered in my article to update them and to introduce them introduce uh, a few uh, new elements. I just leave you with a, a thought from Mrs. Clinton that was reported in an article in, in the New York Times uh, just yesterday. Um, she indicated that uh, during the course of the campaign, particularly over the last few weeks, last few months, that she goes to bed each night with a, a pit uh, in her stomach, you know? And she ended the uh, conversation uh, with the to the reporter, uh, she said to him, I'm, I want to leave you with a thought that I've been saying to a lot of people lately, and that thought is that I'm the person that stands between you and the apocalypse. It looks like Mrs. Clinton is going to win. I think that the key question after the election will be the program that was adopted at the Democratic Party convention, uh, which is very much a program that moves in a very strong direction against neoliberalism, the program that the Sanders movement helped shape. It seems to me that the fight back along those lines is going to be the main issue that will help uh, deflect and divert this uh, growing fascist threat that Trump and his uh, supporters are promoting. Thanks for listening, and that's the end.